A mother cries out in pain, but it took her dying before the country heard her. The coroner calling Joyce Eshaquan's death an undeniable case of systemic racism. Unfortunately, this is not an isolated incident. More than 50% of Canadians think systemic racism is built into the economy, government, and educational systems. Every time I walk onto House of Common Grounds, speak in these chambers, I'm reminded every step of the way I don't belong here. Black, Indigenous, and people of color say they are treated differently, even looked over for promotions and job opportunities. Some black public sector workers are fighting back banding together in a class action lawsuit to speak out against discrimination, hoping real change will happen. I was forced to resign after 19 years because working at the Department of Justice, serving Canadians, I never once received a promotion. And some Indigenous government employees are starting their own legal action, calling out the racism they say happens every day. We feel devalued, we feel abused, and we feel unsafe. At work, in policing, healthcare, and schools, institutional racism can affect the mental health of people of color, fearful the system will work against them. Systemic racism is underpinned by white supremacy. We need to address this. What concrete action can all Canadians take to eliminate institutional racism? And how can people of faith play a role in this fight. Until we deal with those systemic realities, pretending that we live in a post-racial society is just not going to get us anywhere. This week on Context, breaking barriers in institutional racism. Welcome to Context, I'm Maggie John. Institutional racism is defined as policies, rules and practices that are embedded in the way an organization or society works. It results in supporting unfair advantage to some and to others, unfair or harmful treatment based on race. And after years of denial, 50% of Canadians now say it is a real problem. Two class action lawsuits are underway against the government of Canada and underlying this problem. More than 600 former and current black federal employees say they face discrimination and racism at work. And the new class action case was filed last month with 25 Indigenous employees also alleging harassment, discrimination and racism at federal Indigenous agencies and departments. Nicholas Marcus Thompson and Marcia Banfield Smith are two of the plaintiffs in the black class action case. And Letitia Wells is one of the plaintiffs in the indigenous class action lawsuit. They join me now. Nicholas, you are the organizer of this class action lawsuit. What were your experiences seeing, especially seeing others um, as you filed this lawsuit? What were some of the experiences you were hearing? Uh, we heard from employees at the Canadian Human Rights Commission. The commission mandated under the uh, Canadian Human Rights Act to adjudicate on discrimination within our workplace. We heard from Black workers at that commission that the commission was being discriminatory to them as an employees when they made decisions from a race-based perspective, how those decisions were being overturned by their white superiors. We've heard stories from the RCMP, um, workers from the RCMP uh, to workers that worked on the security detail for the prime minister, for successive prime ministers, the black workers across the federal government were facing the same systemic barriers as it pertains to hiring and promotions. Hmm. Marcia, you left your job at the Department of Justice earlier this year. You'd been there for 19 years. What made you say enough is enough? So much for having me. After 19 years of being with the Department of Justice, I had to resign. I felt I was forced to resign because I never once received a promotion. Even though within the 19 years that I was there, I went to law school, I completed law school, I completed my um, LLB, my Juris Doctorate, and I received not one promotion in 19 years. So I had no choice but to leave the Department of Justice. And just to clarify, Marcia, were you seeing others, your co-workers being promoted? Absolutely. I was seeing my non-Black counterparts being promoted, um, at least two promotions ahead of me, constantly being encouraged, um, receiving training. None of that was, was offered to me mm -hmm. at all. Even though I always raised concerns and I always put it on my um, professional performance review, 
that we had twice yearly, and yet I received none of the those privileges, those advantages that my non-Black colleagues were receiving. The, the, the environment there was less than equitable, and it just at that point, I just could not take it anymore. It was just becoming so toxic and just traumatizing, and I, I just had to leave. Mm. Leticia, you are one of the lead plaintiffs in an Indigenous class action lawsuit. Why did you decide to take legal action? It was, uh, for me, it was something that grew out of a report that came out from APTN in April. I had no intention of suing the government. My intent was to walk away in peace. But unfortunately, there's been too much harm to echo off uh, the lawsuit that we just heard from. No promotions. Um, so I've carried that research for about three years that I was in within the government internally. And the collection of the stories, no promotions, uh, entry level positions, no movement up racial language. And so what prompted me to step up to this uh, lawsuit is it needs to be done for change because mm -hmm. the racism is built within the constitution. If the constitution was to have uh, be a living being, if you were to look at it as a spiritual and a living being, it would be a serpent. And that is my whole purpose of stepping up is because of the, to the toxicness and poisonous that uh, we feel as employees, and we have the right to equitable uh, resources and promotions. Wow, to call it a serpent, that, that means that you're living in a, as you said, toxic environment. You're not alone in your experiences. So far, 25 current and former employees have come forward. You describe an atmosphere so painful that colleagues even com contemplated suicide. Explain yes. this to me. There was a time for um, confidentiality reasons, I can't mention names, but I was one of the people at the table, that there was a discussion of suicide, that maybe one of us should sacrifice our lives to be heard internally, because not, we, were, we, were, we are in a position that we're being um, traumatized, we're being triggered, we're being assaulted. Um, and we don't feel good about that. And as single mothers, many of us rely on our income. So there's an, they use the income to control us. And there are, some of them are very targeted attacks. Mm. And so because we felt stuck, we had no way out, you know, to, if we leave, we risk, uh, the federal government's welfare department coming after our children. Mm -hmm. it, we have to stay for that income. So it's 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 a very terrible situation to be in. And it's very um, scary to step forth in something like this when it comes to your mentality, because Western society will deem you not fit. It's not about what ha uh, what's wrong with us. It's about what's happened to us. Yeah, and this is a perfect example of institutional racism, right? So you're not just talking about losing your job, you're talking about losing your children because of issues within the justice system and within the social, social work system. It, it, there are so many different layers and complexities to this issue. Nicholas, this class action um, covers five decades of employees. The institutional racism runs deep. What would you like to see um, so that the next generation isn't going through what you and other people in the lawsuit are going through? Well, what we are seeking to do is to eliminate those barriers that prevent um, Black workers from having those economic opportunities for hiring and promotions at the top levels of Canada's public service. We're seeking accountability measures because we understand that we cannot allow those who have benefited, those who've thrived from systemic discrimination to now be responsible for policing uh, those efforts. We're seeking to have uh, equal uh, representation throughout the entire public service at all levels of the public service, not just entry level positions. Uh, we're seeking to have representation in mid-level management and in, in executive position. Presently, um, the publics in the, in, in the federal public service Black workers um, are reserved for the uh, bottom uh, of the public service. So there is a glass ceiling at the bottom of the public service. Some visible minorities are able to get just above that glass ceiling and the top of the public service is reserved for white folks. Uh, and that's those are the facts. 
And those facts have led to a lot of injuries and we're seeking to prevent those injuries from continuing by uh, ensuring that our public services is inclusive. All right, we're gonna have to end it there. Thank you again, Nicholas, Marcia, and Leticia for your time today. We will be following this story. Thank you again. Context reached out to the Deputy Minister of Inclusion and Diversity to discuss her work and the progress the government has made on inclusion. She declined our interview request. Coming up, how does one deal internally with racism in the workplace? It's called racial trauma, and some experts say it is a condition that's on the rise. Psychotherapist Roxanne Francis will explain. In our fast-paced world, context is everything to the stories that are shaping us. We want to go beyond the headlines in our new podcast to create space for meaningful conversations, to explore where faith intersects with justice, ethics, culture, and society. We'll be joined by newsmakers, peacemakers, and culture shapers. Join us on all podcast platforms or at contextbeyondtheheadlines.com. We just heard from three people who are dealing with the real-life barriers set before them in their attempt to progress in their places of work. How does inequity and institutional racism then impact a person internally? Experts call it race-based trauma. And psychotherapist Roxanne Francis is here to help us understand this more. Welcome, Roxanne. Thank you for having me. So what is race-based trauma and how does it impact someone mentally, emotionally, and physically in the workplace? So race-based trauma is really the stress and uh, difficulty that people experience as a result of racism and systemic oppression, oftentimes uh, in the wider society, but it's largely seen also in the workplace. So we just heard from three people who are a part of a class action lawsuit against the federal government. They claim that due to discrimination, they have not been able to progress in their workplaces. How does that impact the well-being of someone when they feel stuck? Yeah, so when someone feels stuck and they're unable to move forward, oftentimes they internalize that struggle. They start to feel as though there's something wrong with them that they are somehow internally broken, that they are unable to uh, do the job well. Sometimes they see their colleagues move, move ahead of them and advance uh, further along, and they start to feel a lot of anxiety, this, this deep-seated uh, feeling of inadequacy, and it often impacts self-esteem. People feel a sense of uh, you know, low self-worth. And it really impacts their ability to have meaningful relationships with uh, loved ones and peers. And it can even further uh, hamper their development at work. So what are some of the ways people try to cope with this reality? Do they blame, you said they blame themselves sometimes. Do they try to mm -hmm. change their behavior? Or there's a, a term called code switching as well, uh, where you mm -hmm. change the way that you are perceived and the language that you use in order to fit in. That's right, that's right. Uh, code switching is seen very, very often. It's sort of this coping mechanism that people use where they, they, they uh, put aside who they really are in order to fit into what they deem to be the expected norm, particularly at work. Uh, oftentimes people uh, put aside their culture, they put aside their own, even their own personal values in order to fit in at work, in order to help them advance. Uh, people sometimes will uh, you know, no longer engage with others of their own race or of their own culture in order to move forward. Uh, and this can have really devastating consequences. People end up feeling sometimes as though they're even betraying themselves in order to move forward. Uh, sometimes people will try to cope by um, engaging in uh, really devastating behaviors, uh, you know, uh, alcohol, drugs, uh, different kinds of narcotics, um, you know, poor relationships. They find uh, ways to almost excuse the way that they're behaving at work. And oftentimes this can really push other people away and people end up being quite alone and, and very, very miserable. 
Could it be the extreme of contemplating suicide? That's what we heard from one of the plaintiffs, Letitia, that she has heard uh, anecdotally from some Indigenous uh, employees in the government that have contemplated suicide because they just feel like they are being attacked by racism within the organization. Most definitely. And I think for our um, Indigenous uh, friends and, and neighbors, uh, it can be a bit of a double-edged sword where they are being discriminated against at work. And oftentimes, they people might uh, try to fit in so much at work that they put aside their own cultural and spiritual values and then feeling a sense of deep self-hatred because they've done that. And that can result in uh, significant feelings of uh, worthlessness, of helplessness, of hopelessness, and eventually suicidal thoughts. Mm. How can employers help this uh, issue besides obviously treating people fairly? How else can employers step in? Employers can really take a look at what their organization looks like, right? Many organizations will say, well, we're diverse, look at our staff. But what tends to happen is that this diversity per se it, you know, it, it's multifaceted at the ground level, the customer service level, or the entry level. And as you go further up in the organization, it, it looks like what I call the pale pyramid, where the further up in the organization you go, uh, it, it, there are less people and there are less people of color, right? There's less diversity. And so organizations really need to take a look at does their diversity reflect the entire organization or really just at ground level? The other thing that they need to look at is if we do have diversity at the, you know, in the upper tier of our organization, is that only relegated to, uh, you know, gender diversity, right? Oftentimes people will say, well, we're diverse, but what that means is that uh, our leaders uh, incorporate uh, white women. And so we need to look at what diversity means across the whole spectrum of, of life. The other thing that people need to look at is, you know, when they are engaging in things like uh, employee uh, evaluations, we need to ask the question, you know, how can we help you move forward, right? Instead of just relegating that to a specific uh, group of people in the workplace, uh, to your, your point of fairness, but also to, you know, who has access to training, right? Who is working overtime? Who has access to mentorship? in the workplace. And when uh, people are being hired for these uh, leadership positions, instead of just looking at the technical skills, instead of just looking at can they produce, we also need to be looking at uh, how do they um, incorporate uh, equity and equality as they do the work? What has your track record been up to this point? Because if we hire people for whom diversity is a key component, then we won't have to spend thousands of dollars training the entire organization because it will trickle down, right? So these are some things that organizations need to really be aware of. All right, we're gonna have to stop it there. Roxanne Francis, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for having me, Maggie. Next, the Q panel joins the conversation. Does the church need to play a stronger role in fighting racism? Is it realistic for people of color to look to church leaders to advocate for them? We will discuss. We speak peace into the storm, but we don't use weather maps. We are media missionaries. The Q panel is back. Jackie and Moira Bryan is away this week. We have been discussing the sad reality of institutional racism in our country and the real life stories of some who have experienced discrimination in their workplaces, specifically the federal government. Jackie, does this issue get enough attention, institutional racism? Absolutely not. I think. Over the last year, we have seen some changes and we have seen some conversations and some acknowledgement that there is institutionalized racism. But I think the extent to which it exists 
the average individual, unless they experience it, likely does not have a grasp of it and does not understand how it permeates every single system in society and impacts anyone who is of a minority group. I want to stay with you on that point, Jackie. You know, we saw a rush of organizations hiring people of color in the last year as the world woke up to the realities of racism. Is hiring people of color enough to solve the issues that keep coming up? I mean, it's absolutely a start, but it's definitely not enough. If you hire a person who is marginalized, an individual who is of color, and then you don't quite give them the space to express themselves, to be able to make changes in the workplace or whatever environment they're in. If you don't appoint them to leadership positions where they can actually enact this change, if your teams are not open to hearing their criticisms and their suggestions on how to improve a space and create it and to, to make it more welcoming, then no, that's absolutely not really benefiting your workplace or individuals or society at large. And I am a bit concerned that over the last year, as you mentioned, as we've seen these changes, it does appear to be tokenism. Mm -hmm. Everyone, you know, every group wants to have um, the right, quote unquote, the right representation of, you know, people of color or whether it's um, women or, or whatever, what, what, may have you, right? But we really need to go beyond that to make sure that these individuals actually have the power to enact change and the space to do so freely without any sort of repercussions. Mm -hmm. Moira, how do you see the church playing a role in this discussion? I think it has a huge role to play. I mean, so many of us belong to denominations that are truly international, global, in fact, and we do see, I'm talking now about my own Catholic church, mm -hmm. at the highest level, we can see cardinals and archbishops from across the globe. And so it's, it's an, certainly more than tokenism there. I, but I don't really know that it has played down right down through the ranks, right down to you know, the average parish. When I look around my own parish, uh, it's amazing just how sort of uh, monochrome, in fact, sometimes it seems. So I think that at the very local level in my denomination, there's a lot to be done. From the point of view, say, of Indigenous people, for example, in Canada, um, there's not very much. Let's talk about that a little bit more, more Maura. You know, I, I think about that and the fact that when people see themselves represented in a space, then they feel like, oh, I am welcomed in that space. Yeah. And so as you talk about, I think that's really interesting about uh, the lack of Indigenous representation, specifically as you're talking about in the Catholic Church, do you think a lack of representation and seeing that, oh, this is a place where I am welcomed, especially with the history that the Catholic Church has with Indigenous people, how do we change that narrative so that Indigenous leaders feel like the church is a welcoming space for them? Right. I mean, I think that absolutely has to happen. I think it has to happen from a gospel value point of view. Yeah. And I think it has to happen from a sociological and political point of view as well. And that point of it, representation is really important. And so much has come to the fore that I think has just been ignored, not recognized, et cetera. But now it's coming to the fore then, there has to be a different approach. Even locally, say in an individual diocese or local area for another denomination, then pastoral councils, which my de de denomination does have, really needs to reach out and invite people to join it. I mean, people, as you said, Maggie, I think if they don't see themselves represented, represented might feel that they don't belong. And it's up to the group that's already there to reach out and invite them to make sure that they're represented, but they're also promoted, if you like, in terms of leadership, as Jack is saying too. But just that initial moving out from our sometimes pretty insular parochial bases um, and seeing that there, there's a lot we can do at a local level, at a diocesan or say provincial level and gradually to a national level. And it has it, it's probably going to have to be incremental because there's been so much hurt, so much uh, abandonment really, that I think it's true that this sometimes takes a couple of generations to heal 
but the steps have to be taken now. Some faith leaders have shied away from the issue of racism, and specifically today we're talking about institutional racism, Jackie. What does that say to people of color, especially people of color who are Christians? I think it's unfortunate if there's someone who is in a leadership position and is not willing to have this conversation. It's obviously a conversation that makes people difficult and uncomfortable. I think there's also a lot of fear around saying the wrong thing and potentially a lot of guilt associated as well with the privilege that some people have. And for all of those reasons, it may be challenging, but it is still an incredibly important conversation to have. Now, as a person of color, I can walk into a room of individuals and just by the conversation and how things are going, you can sense whether these are individuals who are allies or not, regardless of their background. I may be the only person of color in the room, but you do get a sense of how warm and receptive people are to certain conversations and to acknowledging sometimes um, the, the, the fact that there is this power dynamic at play and having those conversations, be able, being able to speak freely in those environments is so important while we're working towards that change. And I think it's incredibly important for those in leadership positions, particularly if they're not minorities, if they are white, to be able to acknowledge that and embrace those conversations, knowing, of course, that they will say things that are wrong and that could potentially be offensive to people, but that they are really open to learning and that their actions matter regardless of their intent. Yeah, moving the conversation forward. Thank you again, Jackie and Moira, for your insights this week. Thank, Thank you, Megan. Thank you, Megan. Over the last two weeks, we have looked at two issues that cause pain and create barriers in our society for a significant part of our population. Ableism and institutional racism are real issues that need to be addressed and collectively eradicated. And while some might not face the real life struggles that come with the othering many feel because of the way they look, ignoring the ramifications threatens to only further the divide. Thank you for watching. Let us know what you think of today's topic. Join the conversation on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. For all of us here, I'm Maggie John. See you next time. Thank you for your ongoing support of Crossroads, a supporter-funded nonprofit organization and member of the Canadian Centre for Christian Charities. Thanks to faithful people like you, we are able to continue producing context. You can write to Crossroads. PO Box 5100, Burlington, Ontario, L7R 4M2, or visit crossroads.ca to learn more about our programs. Context Beyond the Headlines invites you to an exciting new season. This year, we're expanding our reach with a brand new podcast that will explore the interaction between faith, justice, culture, ethics, and society. As we move forward with this brand new season and the launch of this brand new podcast, would you consider partnering with Context financially? It is because of the generosity of viewers like you that we're able to continue to tell the stories that matter.